to the Workforce Connections podcast, where we discuss workforce development in Southern Nevada. Here's your host. Hi, and welcome to the WC podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, a friend of mine, John Ponder from Hope for Prisoners. John, welcome to the podcast. Hi, I mean, thank you so much for having me. So this is your first time here in our brand new studio. What do you think? Man, I am very, very impressed. I think I want to copy what it is you're doing over here. Very impressed. Well, you can come and uh, use the studio anytime. Excellent. So let's dive right into the reason you're here. I mean, we see it right there on your chest. Tell us about Hope for Prisoners. What is the mission? So the mission of Hope for Prisons is to work with uh, men, women, and young adults that are exiting different arenas of our judicial system to help them to successfully reintegrate back into their home, back into the workplace, and ultimately to help them to be stand-up leaders in the community. How did it get started, John? I know that the story is tied to you because I've uh, obviously attended many graduations, have met a lot of people from your organization, but share with our listeners uh, the beginnings of Hope for Prisoners and the journey to where we are today. Certainly. So Hope for Prisoners was birthed out of my own personal experiences. You know, I was that guy who grew up on the other side of the tracks, had come, been coming out of the system since the t- tender age of 12 years old, being in and out of the different juvenile systems and state prison systems and jail systems, uh, until one day, for me, I stood up in a prison cell, surrendered my life to the Lord, uh, and he turned my life around and dropped this mantle on me to turn right back around and help other men and women who are facing those same challenges I once had to face and do everything I can to remove the barriers and to help to escort them up to the next level of life. I, I heard a story, John, that you tell that, uh, you know, now when you attend uh, a Hope for Prisoners graduation, you see Uh, you know, the secret sauce of having all aspects of law enforcement and the judiciary there uh, supporting this program. But the beginnings of the program were not like that. They were a lot different. Can you tell us a little bit about, I remember the day you said you had, you know, uh, $200 in your pocket and you went into Pecos Road and and, uh, McLeod there and said, I have a dream. Absolutely. It it was a lot less. It was $195 less than that because I started it with just $5. And uh, I walked into the the place, our old facility, uh, you know, with this vision, uh, with this dream in my heart, again, to, you know, create a better opportunities for the men and women who are coming home from our prison system. Uh, Hit the ground running, started digging trenches in this community, uh, trying to put it all together. And, you know, it, it, it took a few years, but we were able to make it happen. Happen. How many people, John, since then until today have been through the Hope for Prisoners program? We've had the privilege to work with over 4,700 men and women have been through our process. And, and John, I think one of the interesting things about the program, and you had, I wanted you to tell a little bit about the study that you had done. I think it was a higher education report and study on the rate of recidivism of the program. Sure. And it gained national recognition. But again, it's important because that's a big number you just gave us, but I think a bigger, more interesting number is how many of those are not going back. Right. And we're, we're very, very encouraged. University of Nevada, Las Vegas had come in and they wanted to take a look at how well we were doing. So they took a look at 522 individuals that were considered hard to hire, uh, considered by every stretch of the statistics should be back in prison. But what they found was uh, that uh, it was out of that 522 individuals, what they determined was that 25% of those individuals, I'm sorry, 74% of those individuals were successful in gaining full-time employment and sustainable wage jobs. 25% of those full-time employed within 17 days after completing our process. But what we're really encouraged about is that out of those 522 people, what they determined was that only 6% of those individuals were returning back to the prison system. That's a number that we're very encouraged uh, by, but we're not satisfied with it. But if you take a look at the national recidivism rate, that's says somewhere or, uh, close to 79% of people who come home from the prison system, within three years, they have reoffended and gone back to the prison yard. So I think that at that 6%, we're knocking it out of the ballpark, but always looking for ways to improve the efficiency of what it is that we do. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the pieces that, that um, spoke clearly to the members of the Workforce Connections Board, which uh, you know helps to fund the work at Hope for Prisoners, through that reentry model at CCDC. And besides uh, funding from 
the public workforce development system through Workforce Connections and the federal government. What other types of funding sources do you rely on to be able to accomplish this work? Yeah, that's that's a really, really great question. We uh, also have a grant from the Department of Justice, but the bulk of what it is that we rely on is those personal and private foundational grants. Those that give us an opportunity, those are some unrestricted dollars that gives us an opportunity to step outside the box of what the norm is to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the people uh, that we have the privilege to serve. So it's important then uh, to have that uh, philanthropy, if you will, here of the community, uh, both probably corporate and private philanthropy. Is that correct? Absolutely. 100%. So any listeners that believe in this cause and have some extra cash, reach out to John Ponder at Hope for Prisons. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for that <laughs> plug. <laughs> so, John, let's dive down into the specifics then. Uh, you know, this funding pays for a lot of things. And of course, you know, uh, this these kinds of services can't be dispensed out of a vending machine. You require staff and personnel to do all these assessments that you do in the, in the case management and the follow-up and the removal of barriers. So tell us uh, what somebody... Uh, your participants, what kind of services they receive throughout this journey that they make? And maybe tell us how many months that journey is. Right. So, so, um, what we found to be, um, to be successful, uh, in our model is that, uh, we've learned that the, the majority of people from this segment of the population, they really want to change. They have no idea how to do it. So for so long, we've been telling people from this segment of the population to return back to the community and become a productive member of the community or, or go out and get a, a good paying job and keep that job. And some of the people have never worked a day before in their life. So what we found to be successful is when we wrap services around the individual to make sure they have the support that they need. And that comes from case management, that comes from mentoring, which is a big piece of what it is that we do. Because if you ask anybody who has ever achieved any significant level of success in life, how you do it, how'd you get there? If they're honest with you, they're going to admit that they didn't get there by themselves. They had people that were in their life that was guiding, directing, push, pulling, dragging, sometimes kicking in the butt every single step of the way. So we, what we found was that when we provide them with these services to make sure that we're helping the individuals to become assets to the community and not liabilities. We help them to become assets to the community when we utilize the workforce dollars to make sure that we're putting them through training. And, and one of the things that we found, and we know the employment is just a, a, a huge piece of that, uh, the thing that we found, Jaime, is that uh, most employers are not, not willing to hire formerly incarcerated people. They're not willing to hire a project. So when we could take the workforce dollars and utilize them to put them through some vocational training to where we can help them to get certified in whatever that is and be able to tie that directly with employment to enable the people that we have the privilege to serve to, to, to uh, gain a sustainable uh, wage employment so they can take care of themselves and take care of their family. And so John, um, I agree with you. I think, you know, self-sufficiency and being able to take care of yourself first and then your family obviously happens through uh, the ability to hold a job, as you said. And so sometimes you have to uh, address that skill acquisition need. But what if there's other <clears throat> barriers to employment? What if the person doesn't have transportation or access to affordable childcare mm -hmm. or uh, the lack of uniforms, the tools that that employer that wants to hire him uh, or her needs. Can, do you step in there as well? Oh, absolutely, 100%. And I think that you hit the nail right on the head. We know that there are four major things that we need to address to help formerly incarcerated people be successful on the outside. When we address their need for transportation, when we address their needs for employment, when we address their needs for family uh, reunification, and those are the things that that uh, is necessary for in order for them to be successful. Great. And John, I know uh, let's build on that uh, idea of skill acquisition, because again, uh, as you said, this is a perfect time for your participants to compete in the market because uh, the market is hot for um, job seekers right now. There's Absolutely. more jobs than, you know, than job seekers available. So employers, I think, are learning that it's not as it was maybe pre-pandemic where, you know, there was a lot of workers available. And so I think your participants have a renewed opening there, a window that's attracted to them. And 
to tie in that, I got to walk your brand new facility. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful multi-story facility that you're there uh, sharing with the Ahern people. And they have some, Ahern Rentals have some amazing training uh, devices and systems there on the other floors that you and your programs have access to. So tell us a little bit about that and other aspects of this beautiful facility that you're now in. Yeah, and we are really, really, really excited. We, we've taken 17,000 square feet uh, inside that building. And what we did is I moved all of our executive staff there, all of our directors, our case managers, our mentor coordinators, our substance abuse counselors are in-house. Uh, but what we're really excited about is we built out five different classrooms to where we're gonna be doing all the stuff that Hope for Prisons does, the leadership classes and the communication classes and uh, parenting classes, but we're going to be bringing the vocational training in under that roof. So this is going to give us the opportunity to train formerly incarcerated people uh, in skills like HVAC, plumbing, air conditioning, uh, CDL school, culinary, warehouse logistics. Again, all of those things where we want to be able to equip them to make sure that when those doors that you just spoke about, you know, there, there is more jobs out there that we can possibly fill. We just want to make sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can to make sure that they're trained and equipped to get inside those workplaces and go above and beyond the call of duty. And again, I know that you have welcomed uh, not only us, Workforce Connections, but Dieter also, your workforce partners there to, uh, again, share the space. Uh, but I've also seen you invite the library district, the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, our friend Kelvin Watson, who's on our Workforce Connections board as well. Uh, I've also walked through a space where you told me there's going to be local churches having services and streaming. And, you know, so there's a lot of things happening in this building. Why uh, I can sense that you were very purposeful about making it, a, if you will, a one-stop shop for your participants. Why is that important? It is so important because the success that Hope for Prisons has experienced over the years has, has come from, uh, I use these two words, unprecedented partnerships, right? So when we can bring the community together to wrap those services around, uh, you know, formerly incarcerated people, that's what is going to help their lives to be more successful. And this is the reason why, and I want people to start looking at a new location as a central door, right? It's the central door for, for people to come in home to be able to come to so they can have access to our great partnerships. You mentioned the Workforce Connections in the, uh, in the Vegas Chamber, but we partner with the College of Southern Nevada and and CSN is planting a satellite campus inside the parameters of those four walls. This way, it gives our people an opportunity to pursue that academic track. And for those who you know may not desire to go to college, there's the workforce piece in there as well. We're bringing in partnership with parole and probation, which is I'm really excited. Never, nowhere else in this country is an embedded parole officer in an NPO to work directly with the case manager and the sub substance abuse counselor and the mentor coordinator and job developer to make sure that that participant is engaged and moving forward. Yeah, so, so much happening in there, John. And you just mentioned, uh, I'm grateful you mentioned a few other members of the Workforce Connections Board. Uh, as you said, Mary Beth Sewell from the Vegas Chamber. She always says, hashtag, we like each other. Yes. Um, she's watching us now. And then, uh, of course, you mentioned, um, I mentioned Kelvin Watson from the library, Linda Parvin from Dieter, are all members of our board. But you mentioned Federico Zaragoza from CSN. Uh, is there. Yes. And so I'm just thinking you, you've you got all my board members there in that in that building, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just realizing that. <laughs> so that and that was very strategic. <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good thing. So um, you mentioned about employers and, and one of the things that, that I, I think uh, everybody is impacted by when they go to their graduations is there's employers there that already yeah. work with you and hire your people. And, and they say, um, you know, I'm back for more because the, the one or two or three people that I have are some of my best employees. Mm -hmm. And so tell us, you know, we here at Workforce Connections, everything that we do, whether it be, again, initiatives that uh, that are as early as the K through 12 system with another board member, uh, Jesus Jara from CCSD, mm -hmm. our superintendent, we're trying to, uh, if you will, embed into that talent development pipeline that starts in the school district, but then goes to the community college and other post-secondary skill acquisition partners. But we're trying to start with Mary Beth and her businesses. Mm -hmm. Peter Guzman, another member of our board from uh, the Latin Chamber of Commerce. We want to understand the needs of business and then 
if you will, embed those needs into that talent development pipeline. Now you're doing something effective because your employers are saying, I like what your what your workers look like in, in my business. So tell us why is it that employers are saying that they want to come back and get more hope for prisoners graduates? What's yeah. the secret sauce? You know, you know, it all comes down to to a couple of things. It's the training and the equipment equipping of the people that are going to be going inside the workplaces. You know, when we started out many years ago, uh, Jaime, our goal was to change the face of reentry. We wanted to change what it means to be formerly incarcerated people who have paid their debt to society and trying to get acclimated back in the community to have opportunities for them. But the only way we can be able to do that is to, is to train up a massive amount of people who uh, come home from the prison system. And not only do they never reoffend again, but they begin to live levels of life that most people only dream of. So the key, that secret sauce with, in getting folks plugged in with employment is once they get inside that workplace, we let their employer know that they're not just hiring John and Jane Doe, the formerly incarcerated person. They're hiring this entire community of people that are going to be with them while they're inside that workplace, not only to help them to, to walk out all those incredible things that we're training them with, but we're there with them to help them to navigate whatever challenges they're going to be facing, not only inside that workplace, but inside you know, the, the reentry arena. We do not believe in job placement. Uh, the secret of our partners is job partnership, right? Getting folks in there plugged in. And when we wrap those services around that and, and place them inside, we find that other people are just literally going in there and going above and beyond the call to duty. And this is what's causing employers to come back and say, hey, listen, you know, so-and-so was above and beyond the call to duty. Can I get two more of those? And as a result of that, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting in more jobs right now than we can fill. Uh, and the blessing in the pandemic and, uh, w you know, with, with employers looking for staff, um, because it was such a vacuum there, uh, we are now working with employers that have never even considered hiring formerly incarcerated people in the past. But I'm also very mindful, and I, I want to encourage people in the reentry community, uh, that we have to make sure that we, uh, we get it right uh, when doing that. You have that employer who's never hired a formerly incarcerated person before. We got to make sure that that person uh, is equipped and prepared to go above and beyond the call of duty once they get inside that workplace to make sure they're trained and equipped and, and, um, and, and able to be promoted up in. And this is how you begin to change the mindsets of people from this segment of the population. And I believe that by doing that, we'll, you know, we'll change the landscape of reentry. And they represent, one of the things I hear always said in the graduation is those that are doing a good job now, a great job with employers are opening the doors for those following them, the Absolutely. next graduations that you have. And so John, <clears throat> in your graduations, you know, one of my favorite parts is these vivid visions, you know, where a participant, um, you have them take the time to collect thoughts and envision themselves a full year ahead. Right. And, and it's so wonderful because I think life is nothing if you can't imagine success. And, and you know, if you don't have, you have to have that hope that one day things can be better. Mm -hmm. And and every time you hear a vivid vision from a person, they project into a, into a future that's a better place than where they are today. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a marvelous exercise. And then uh, also there's, you have uh, formal, uh, former participants that are three, four years into their journey that come back and share how their vivid vision became a reality. Right. And, you know, and those, uh, again, are my favorite parts. I know uh, both of my kids have attended the graduation as well as they always say, I wonder how many vivid visions we're going to see today. <laughs> and, and I say, you know, yeah, it depends on how many big names John has giving speeches, you right. know, because sometimes you're like, I think we have time for another vivid vision. And I, I would say, uh, we need to have less of us talking and more of those vivid visions, you right. know, because they're, yeah. they're like favorite. But where did that idea of a vivid, vivid vision come from? Yeah, so we've been doing that uh, many, many years. And, and the thing that I like about the vivid vision uh, is because we it, we challenge people to take a look at their life, you know, one year from today, right? Uh, and, and just imagine what that life will be. In other words, wake up in the morning, 
put down on the piece of you know put it down on a piece of paper and walk us through a day in your life and the reason why we want them to be able to to fix their eyes on that vision it, it helps to develop their hope right because if you ever see somebody who's just completely hopeless right we see people like that every single day and the reason why they're hopeless is because they cannot see their future right? They can't see past tomorrow. They can't see past next week. But when we're able to get someone to rise up out of that place of hopelessness and see a future and then have faith in the process that that there is obtainable, that's when the person finds hope uh, in the moment. And I tell people all the time, I I, I, I think I have the, uh, as a CEO of this organization, I, I have the best seat in the house, right? And I say that because I see people walk through the door, right? We interact people, uh, you know, as they walk through the door and, and some people are hopeless, some people are at rock bottom, some people have absolutely nothing. But when they're engaged in our process and grab hold of that vivid vision, I have the great privilege of gradually and me over time, kind of watching the evolution of life and seeing them at the 18 month mark and they're back with their family and they're saving money. They've gone back to school and they've got degrees and certifications. You know, you can't put a, a you can't put a price tag on that. I agree. John, earlier we, uh, we put in our plug for the uh, philanthropic community for any donors interested in, you know, uh, helping the cause to reach out to you. Now I'd like to maybe take advantage of this opportunity. If we have any employers listening in our audience, small businesses that have said, you know, I'm tired of looking, uh, I can't find them or I find the wrong ones. And they're encouraged by the stories you've told about employers that not only hire from you once, but keep coming back. Uh, I want you to address those listeners and say, how can they connect with you and, and hire some of your participants? Right. Well, you can certainly look us up at hopeforpersons.org, but I just want to encourage the employers out there and tell them this. Uh, you know, we have some uh, men and women who are hungry for success, right? That, that have been trained and equipped uh, and probably able to get inside workplaces and perform from people who've never gone through this process. You know, there's leadership training, effective communications, a healthy boundaries as it relates to the workplace. We uh, know that they're gonna get in there and go above and beyond the call of duty every single day inside their workplace. You know, we do random UAs and they don't wanna disappoint us. So we know that, you know, the employee we can take that from the employer and in any challenge that the employer has when you hire a Hope for Prisons graduate, with the exceptions, Jaime, of them doing something ridiculous, fighting, stealing, whatever the case would be, we hope that not be the case, but we, we ask them to don't even fire them in this partnership to pick up the phone and give us a call. And with every resource that we have available to us, we're gonna come alongside that individual to make sure that that person is going literally above and beyond the call of duty. And if we do that effectively, the employer wins, but you know who else wins? The next individual that's coming through the door that that formerly incarcerated person has opened up the door for, and we'll just keep going and it creates such a win-win for the entire community. So the employer is not just hiring that participant, he's also getting that whole network that supports that participant. Absolutely, a network of people that are, is, is dedicated to seeing that person be successful. Give you an example, what does that mean? We, we train our participants, so let's just say if they get a job and their, their job is, uh, is from eight to five. And um, if, if that person shows up at eight o'clock, he's late. We're conditioning them to make sure that every single day they're gonna walk through that door at 745. Anything less than that is below the standards of what it is that we're requiring them to do. And we give the employer an opportunity to pick up the phone, uh, let his case manager mentor to come alongside to mentor them through that process. So any challenge whatsoever, and the employers are just absolutely have fallen in love with that model. And again, this extra support system that they're getting comes at no extra cost to the employer. No extra cost whatsoever to the employer. You know, one of the things that uh, we found successful with the employers, we're telling the employer that we're gonna do everything that we possibly can to ensure that person is successful and, and, and the resources available to them to be successful. But in the partnership with some of the employers, we asked the employer to, to meet us in the middle. 
right? They are uh, investing time, effort, energy, and resources in the training per- the person up, and this meet us in the middle, and with the two of us, working with them, us on the outside, the employer on the inside, 18 months from now, that will be one of the best employees inside the workplace who has opened up the door for the next person that's graduating Hope for Prisoners. And as a matter of fact, John, uh, if, if that participant happens to be eligible for WIOA services, then you can even do even more and incentivize that employer with OJTs and programs like that. Absolutely. So you have the OJTs, you have the, the WEX funding, and that is for uh, employers, uh, em- employees who don't have any training. We could actually uh, get them hired there and we would absorb, they'd be on our payroll for a particular period of time so that they give the employer an opportunity to, you know, to, to, to train this person. And if it gets to the end, of it and it doesn't work out, which we hope that it will, we know that it will, then the participant then uh, gains some valuable insights and skill sets that we can put on a resume to go someplace else. Well, John, I want to thank you for being uh, here in the podcast today, sharing with our audience the amazing program that is Hope for Prisoners. Again, taking a segment of our population and uh, not just rehabilitating, as you said, but really uh, sending them on a pathway to success, uh, reintegrating with their families, with with our community, making our community safer. Uh, You know, we appreciate the, the, the work that you do here at Workforce Connections. And again, thank you for spending this time with us here today. Yeah, I am so honored to be here, Jaime. And and thank you so much for your partnership with Workforce. And, you know, I want to thank all of other other collaborating partners that come alongside this mission to help the people from this segment of the population. And if you think about what it is that we're doing, we're taking people who were former wards of the state. They were they were burdens to the taxpayers. But when we come together in that unprecedented unity, right, we're taking those who were once bordered to the board burden to the state and help transform them into taxpaying members of our community. The minute we're able to get them back to work, uh, earning sustainable wages, we're getting people off of social services and no longer dependent on, 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 on food stamps and things of that nature. And the minute that we do that, we come together and help them to be fuel in the economic engine of our community. Honored to be here. That's awesome, John. Again, um, thank you for the work that you do. I'll be coming by to see that new banner uh, that we talked about. Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that's it for this episode of the WC Podcast. We hope to see you at the next one. And until then, stay safe. So, John, thank you for staying with us for our bonus segment called Against the Wall. The first part is called Your Favorites. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Tell us your favorite restaurant in Las Vegas. My favorite restaurant in Las Vegas. Hmm. I think that it would have to be, I don't know. You've been to a couple with me. I mean, any of those are good. You know, I really do love um, P.F. Chang's. I was hoping Peru chicken, but I'm I was going to say start. that. <laughs> What's your favorite book? The Bible. Your favorite outdoor activity? Hiking. Your favorite place to go with your family? Uh, church. Favorite sport to watch in person? Football. Favorite sport to watch on TV? Hockey. Favorite way to relax? Read. Here we go. You ready? Your favorite gospel song? Oh my gosh, peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> yes. Right. When you come back, we're going to have a special segment with John singing on I'm the mic. Sing yeah, it. yes. Yes. All right. Congratulations. You made it through our first segment called Your Favorites. Now we're going to move on to the one called Tough Choices. Are oh you ready? Oh my goodness. Yes. When you travel out of state and you do a lot, do you rather do it by car or by plane? By plane. On Sundays, would you rather sleep in a little bit or wake up earlier to have a hearty breakfast? Wake up early. Would you rather be rich and famous or rich and unknown? Rich and unknown. Would you, are you a person with a glass half full or half empty? It's always half full. Would you rather go to a concert or a sports event? Uh, a concert. Do you prefer justice or grace? Grace. And my favorite, are you about actions or words? 
100% actions. All right. We're getting ready here for the last segment, John, called Finish the Sentence. So I'm going to give you almost a complete sentence, and you're going to finish it for me. First one, not many people know that John likes to run. If John could travel back in time, he would go back to 1982. I'm not going to ask you why. Don't. If John could travel to any city in the world, he would go to Miami. Three words that describe John are integrity, perseverance, and faithfulness. Very good. John's biggest joy in life is family. Doing the WC podcast today was amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you for staying over, John. All right.